God. Who art the beginning and the amen of all things. We, your blood-bought people, come now to worship you through Jesus Christ our Lord. to you from Open Door Believers Chapel on the south side of Belize City in Central America. We are a Plymouth Brethren Assembly, a layman's movement, and this is a pre-recorded service. Let us not be weary in well-doing as we continue praying for our country and God's people worldwide. And remember the Fellowship Family Date on Zoom each Wednesday at 7 p.m. Oh 
to you from the one who is and was and is coming and from the seven spirits before his throne and from Jesus Christ. Jesus is the faithful witness, the first among those raised from the dead. He is the ruler of the kings of the earth. He is the one who loves us, who made us free from our sins with the blood of his dead. He made us to be a kingdom of priests who serve God his Father. To Jesus Christ be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look, Jesus is coming with the clouds, and everyone will see him, even those who pierced him. And all peoples of the earth will cry loudly because of him. Yes, this will happen. Amen. The Lord God says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the one who is and was and is coming. I am the Almighty, the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of all God has made. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Behold, 
when the scriptures say Christ is the Amen. It simply means he is God's yes. God's confirming yes of certainty to all the promises he ever made. This is the reason why we can say without doubting, Amen to the glory of God. Amen, he comes to bring his own reward. Amen, praise God. Amen, amen, for justice now silent reflection.
Our speaker today is our brother, Ryan Faust. Ryan is the youth pastor of Thrive Church in Indianola. He's no stranger to us in Belize. He has been coming here for many years, and he loves us dearly. Good morning, Belize. It is so great uh, that I can join you from thousands of miles away. Thank you for letting me join you uh, and be here with you. Uh, guys, uh, I just want to congratulate Nomar and Nicole on the new addition to their family. Uh, what a blessing it has to be uh, for them to be able to experience that, you know, the sleepless nights and the changing of diapers and all those good things that come along with uh, a newborn. But uh, seriously, congratulations, Nomar and Nicole, and may your family continue to be a blessing to the people in Belize. Uh, I want you to know that I just walked inside to our church here in Iowa, and it was a blustery, like 45 to 50 degrees outside. It is freezing cold up here. And so while you're sitting at, uh, at home or sitting wherever you're at, listening to this message or watching this message, I want you to just stop and be thankful that you are having like 75, 85 degree days maybe even a little bit warmer and you got that fresh breeze coming off the ocean uh, be thankful that you get that because the fresh breeze we have now is a very very cool crisp breeze uh, I want to pray for us and then we're gonna get started here today father God we thank you for this day God we thank you for uh, the Jesus that unites us that even though we are thousands of miles apart father that we have grown and fostered a relationship um, with our friends and family in Belize God, we thank you for them. We ask that you will bless them, bless their ministry, bless their church, bless their families, Father. We ask you these things. In your name we pray. Amen. Uh, in 2007, it was the summer of 2007, my wife and I, my wife Darlene and I, uh, found out that we were pregnant. And as any parents at the very first time trying to figure out uh, exactly what's, what you're going to do and how are you going to respond and the kind of the shocking news, knowing that your life is about to change. Uh, we did that and uh, we, we questioned and were like, what in the world just happened? How did that happen? I mean, really, we understood how that happened. We, we get that part of it, but here we go. We are going to be parents. And so we were nervous and we were excited like any first time parents would be. And uh, we told a few of our family and they were excited for us and and we just kind of began mentally and emotionally preparing for the opportunity uh, to be parents. And uh, it was later on that month that uh, my wife and I, uh, my wife started feeling some discomfort and some things weren't necessarily going right. She just didn't feel quite right. We went to our summer camp uh, where we were serving um, as counselors and we were working with the youth at our summer camp and she just wasn't feeling right. Things weren't, weren't right. She, it, it, she was having some abdominal discomfort. She was, um, she was, uh, had some light bleeding and just, just some things that just weren't going right. And so we called the doctor, talked to the doctor for a little bit while we were down there. And, you know, they kind of encouraged us and, and said, yeah, this is normal. We'll do some tests when she gets back. And so we got back and we did, um, some tests and found out that, uh, the numbers, her pregnancy numbers weren't going up like they should be. And so as a result, she was going to have, uh, an, uh, uh the, she was going to lose the baby. And so obviously this was devastating to us and this was hard and we couldn't believe, you know, we went from the roller coaster of, of the high of being so excited that we were going to be parents to the, to the being able to tell our families to now realizing that that dream at this moment wasn't going to become a reality. And so it was hard and it was a struggle for us during that time. And, and a, a, a few weeks went by and Darlene still wasn't feeling right. And we got uh, to August and she wasn't feeling right. Things weren't going, I mean, it just wasn't going smooth. And so she went, we ended up going to the hospital here in the United States and we went and we uh, got checked in and, and we spent all night in the ER and all day. And they said, listen, yeah, there's some internal bleeding. You know, we're gonna have to get this fixed and we're gonna get this stopped in order for her her, you know, for the pain and to subside and, and so on and so forth. And so it was a Friday night and uh, I'd been at the hospital for a while. So I walked downstairs to get something to eat. And immediately I wasn't even gone, maybe like two minutes. I got a phone call that said, Hey, you need to get back up here. They're taking away Darlene for emergency surgery. They need to, they need to, they need to take care of something right now and you need to get back up here. And so obviously I dropped everything. I ran up there, you know, and just in time as they were wheeling her out of the room for emergency surgery. And so 
um, what she, her request was at that time is don't take my fallopian tube. Don't, don't take that tube. You know, don't. And she was very concerned about that. And we were, um, and for the next hour or two or however long the surgery, it was just kind of a blur, you know, and we couldn't believe that this was taking place because you know what, what I didn't tell you is it was August 10th of 2007, which was our fifth anniversary at five years to the day that we had got married. Uh, all of this was taking place. We had spent, we'd spent, uh, our first, uh, our, our fifth anniversary in the emergency room of the hospital. And so it ended up, Darlene went through surgery. She came out all, she came out okay. And it took her a while to emotionally and physically heal from the ordeal. And I don't share that story. Uh, I, I share that story a lot right now because I think it's a lot of what we were facing. We were facing a lot of fear, a lot of unknown, a lot of uncertainty. We were scared. We thought life was going to go in one direction. All of a sudden it went into a different direction. And I can't help but think that a lot of you, even though we're thousands of miles away and we're dealing with this whole COVID thing and we're dealing with all these different things that are going on in our world and in our society, that you can't help, that you might be feeling the exact same way at this moment. You see, perhaps you're feeling uh, a bit anxious because you're not sure how things are going to work out. You're, you're, you're feeling a bit uncertain because this is just chaos and you don't know where the future is going to, going to hold or, or right now you're facing the unknown and you don't know what's going to happen. And so you are anxious, you're concerned, you're scared. You have all these feelings that are going on. You, you, you see, our lives have changed drastically. Your lives have changed drastically. Our lives have changed drastically. Our lives aren't the same as they were a year ago. And with all those things and with all those challenges brings a lot of uncertainty. But the thing that we can be very, very important and very, very, we can rely on is that God is who he says that he is. You see, I want to share a story with you um, that, that I really honestly, this story, I should probably be doing like six weeks series for you. But we're going to talk about the guy, Joseph in the Old Testament. His story is found in Genesis 37 through Genesis 50. I challenge you, you know, you want to read that story. It's a really easy narrative to read. It's a really easy story to go through and take place. So take some time and read that this week. But we're going to kind of give you a bird's eye view of the story. And we're going to, we're going to fly through it because I really believe that the truths that are found in Joseph's life can be applied to the things in which we're dealing with here today. You see, but I, uh, before we do that, I want to get to the end of the story. In Genesis chapter 50, this is something that Joseph says, and this is going to make so much sense to you after we read and understand the whole story. But Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, one of my favorite verses in the Bible, it says, Joseph said this to his brothers. He says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. You intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. And I think that's going to be important to have that verse in the back of your mind as we go through the story of Joseph. And so to get started with Joseph, we have to understand that Joseph was the 11th of 12 brothers. And in fact, he was his dad's favorite. His dad gave him special gifts, gave him a special coat. And this made Joseph's brothers extremely jealous. His older brothers were jealous because here's this young guy that's, that's doing all these things and getting all these things. And he's daddy's favorite. And that makes us a little bit jealous. You see, I have two kids. And when one of my kids gets something that the other kid doesn't, it's instant. It's instant jealousy. Like one kid might get to stay up a little bit later than the other kid and the other kid thinks he's getting gypped. Or one kid might get ice cream from grandma and the other one doesn't and he's getting gypped. It doesn't matter. There's always this kind of idea of sibling rivalry. And this was no different with Joseph and his brothers. And in fact, one day Joseph had a dream that his dream, he was going to rule over his brothers. And I don't know how you are in the birth order. I don't know if you're the little brother or the, you're the older brother. I don't know where you are at exactly. But I want you to imagine for a second that your little brother comes to you and says, you know what? One day you're going to bow down to me. I had a dream and you're going to bow down to me and you're going to, uh, uh, I'm going to rule over you. And I don't know, since I'm the oldest person in, in my family, uh, if my brothers say that to me, I'm like, uh, yeah. Yeah, no, that's not happening. Uh, I'm going to keep you down where you belong. But anyway, this was the story. This was the dream in which Joseph had. And so what happened was, you know, his brothers got jealous and they plotted to kill him. They decided they were so done with Joseph that they were just going to kill him. And so they took Joseph and, and, and finally some, one of the brothers had some sense and says, hey, let's not kill him. Let's just sell him into slavery. And so they sold him to, to some uh, Egyptians that were traders that were, that were coming by. And here goes Joseph all the way to Egypt. 
You see, Joseph, Joseph went from the comforts of life. He went from being comfortable to the unknown. He had to go to a whole new world that he had no idea what was going, going to happen. He went from having a great family that he thought that loved him and, and was with him to having nobody, for them betraying him and selling them. You see, he went from freedom to captivity. He went from having servants to being a servant. He went from community to isolation. He went from abundance to nothing, just like that. You see, Joseph had to face the unknown. You know, oftentimes in our lives, we're facing the unknown in our lives. We don't know sometimes how we're going to put food on the table. We don't know how sometimes we are going to get through the situation, this health concern that we have. We have no idea how we are going to get through being parents. We have no idea how we're going to get through this conflict. We have no idea how this is going to resolve itself. We have no idea how we're going to have money for electricity. We have no idea. These are things in which we face. And Joseph faced those exact same things. Things. He was facing the unknown, the uncertainty of what was going on. And, and, and so he, he goes from uh, being daddy's favorite to getting sold to this guy named Potiphar. And Potiphar, uh, Joseph worked hard. God blessed him. Potiphar recognized it. And, pa- and Joseph worked his way up the ladder uh, at Potiphar's house. And so he was like the head slave. And so he was in charge of a lot of things because God had blessed him. He had worked hard. He had done his things and what he needed to do. And so what happened was one day Potiphar was gone. And so Potiphar's wife decided that she wanted something that Joseph wasn't willing to give. Something that shouldn't have happened. And so as a result, Potiphar, Joseph's like, listen, no, I'm not going to sleep with you. I don't want anything to do with you. And he fled and he ran away from the temptation. He ran away from sin. He, he, he decided that he was going to not sit there and, and, and feel sorry for himself. Because what happens sometimes when we get things go, don't go our way? We feel like it's okay for us to sin. We feel like it's okay because this bad thing happened. It's okay because this happened. So I'm going to do this and it's just one little bad thing and it's not that, 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 that bad. And so as humans, we become entitled and we start to excuse our behavior based upon the circumstances in which are taking place in our lives. Oh God, it's just one drink. I just need one little drink. It's not, it's not a big deal. Or I just need, I just need, you know, it's just one time of having an affair. It's not that big a deal. But in reality, It is a big deal. And we cannot allow sin to creep up into our lives. And we need to flee from sexual immorality. We need to flee from the idea of sin. And that's exactly what Joseph did. He fled the situation. And so Potiphar's wife yelled, screamed, and yelled. And as a result, uh, Joseph was accused of rape. He was thrown in prison. And he did the right thing. You see, this is what's crazy is a lot of times in life we think that that because we follow God and we follow Jesus, that everything is going to go smooth and it's going to go okay and everything's going to work out and it's not going to be that big a deal. But oftentimes when we follow God, it's kind of the opposite of that. Sometimes things get tough. Sometimes things get harder. Sometimes you get accused of doing things that you didn't do. Sometimes people persecute you. Sometimes that happens. And so Joseph faced the unfairness of life because as a result of, of, of doing the right thing, not sleeping with this lady, he ends up in prison. Com- totally and completely unfair. And sometimes in our lives, we do the right thing and things become unfair. We go to work and we work hard and we do all the things and all of a sudden we get laid off. And we don't understand why that's happening. Or, or we work really hard at our kids and we teach them and, and we, we show them the right ways to go. And we show them the path in which they should go. And then they turn and they make poor decisions. We felt like we did what was right. We were obedient. But it's unfair because there's... They went a different direction. Life is unfair at times. And so Joseph faced the unfairness of that. And so as Joseph was sitting there in prison, I mean, I just want you to think about for a second, what do you think he thought about? I mean, each and every night, I mean, and I'm guessing it was not a a luxury hotel that he was staying in. But he was sitting there and every single night, you know, he had a chance. I mean, did he think about his brothers back home? That started this all by throwing him in there. Did he think about Potiphar's wife who accused him of nothing? Did he allow the bitterness in his life at all to creep in? What do you think 
that Joseph thought about each and every night as he was in prison for doing, for doing something that was right. So life, life happens, and, 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 and Joseph's in prison for a little, for, for some time, and, and some pe- people from Pharaoh's court uh, get, get put in prison, and, and they're having these dreams, and they interpret these dreams. And, and, and they can't interpret their dreams or troubled by their dreams. Joseph interprets these dreams. And so Joseph what, you know, says, listen, I'll interpret it, but what you have to do is you can't forget me. I don't want you to, be for, I don't want you to forget me. I want you to remember me when you leave this place. You know, don't, don't forget me. And so Joseph interprets the dreams. What he interprets in these dreams comes true. And guess what happens? They forget him. And so some more time flash. Here, Joseph's forgotten in prison. He does, again, does a good deed. He's forgotten. He's let go. And so eventually some time passes. A lot of time passes. And Joseph's sitting in here in prison. And Pharaoh, who's in charge of Egypt, begins to have these dreams. And he's troubled by them. And nobody can interpret these dreams at all. And so what happens is Joseph... So who Joseph, who Joseph interpreted the dreams for earlier, uh, remembered, oh, there's that guy. He knows how to interpret dreams. Let's get him. And so they bring Joseph in, and, and, and Joseph comes in, and, and Pharaoh tells him his dreams. He's like, yep, I can do this. I can interpret your dreams. Well, I can't, but God can through me. Use me. And so God used Joseph to and, and, and interpreted these dreams. And what happened was in, in the land of Egypt, there was going to be seven years of prosperity. Things were going to go well. F- foods were going to be great. There's going to be lots of uh, abundance. Things were going to go well. But then after that seven years, there was going to be seven years of famine. And so with that seven years of famine, you know, there had to be a plan in order for people to survive. And so because of Joseph's ability to interpret the dream, he was able to come up with a plan on how to fix this and how this was going to help the land of Egypt. And so Pharaoh put Joseph in charge, second in charge of all of Egypt. And so he went from um, being a slave, being, being a servant, uh, to being a prisoner, to all of a sudden the next day he wakes up. And he's second in command of all of Egypt. And he had a plan in which things were going to happen. And so exactly how the dreams went happened. And and, and what happened was there were seven years of prosperity. And then there were seven years of famine. And during the prosperity times, they saved lots of grain. And they saved food back in order so that people would be able to eat when the famine came. And so... We fast forward a little bit and the famine strikes the land and people in that land begin to get hungry. You know who else begins to get hungry? Joseph's family. The brothers who think he's dead, he's long gone, have no idea he's there. Their family begin to get hungry. And they hear that there is a reason to go to Egypt and there's a reason because they have food and we're going to go trade with them so they'll give us food. And so the brothers trek all the way to Egypt to ask for food. And, and they ask Joseph for food. They don't even know that it's their brothers. And I want you to imagine that scene for a second, that you're face to face with the person, you're face to face with the people that have spun your life out of control. You are face to face with the per- people that have sold you into slavery, your own family that rejected you, that gave up on you. And you have the power and you have the control that at any time that you so wish, snap your fingers and they could be put to death. He had the power to do that. And he comes face to face with his brothers. And through some other things and, 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 and a little bit of story, and definitely go and read it. But Joseph gives his brothers the food. He tells them, go home. He reveals himself. Hey, I'm your brother Joseph. And they're just like blown away. I want you to go get our father. Bring the family here. Let's, let's feed them. Let's take care of them. And so, and so Joseph's dream that he had back in the day became a reality. His brothers bowed to him. His brothers, he ruled over his brothers. He provided with his brothers. He saved his entire family. And you see, what, what, what didn't make sense was the uncertainty that he faced. What didn't make sense was the unknown that he faced. What didn't make sense was the, the unfairness the, that he faced through this process. But the whole time, God was working behind the scenes to put Joseph in a position where he could save his family. His family comes, they live there for a while, and then Joseph's dad dies. And so what happens now is Joseph's brothers get nervous. They're like, did Joseph just keep us alive because our dad, 
uh, was alive. Is he going to punish us now for what we did to him? And, and so Joseph meets with his brothers and he said this. He says, listen, you intended to harm me, but God meant it for good. Can you imagine the power in that statement? That, and that, that the peace that Joseph had to do in order to deal with the pain in his lives. You see, when we're wounded and when we're in pain, we have to remember that God is with us. That when life is throwing things at us that we don't understand, we have to understand. It's cliche, I know, but we have to understand that God is with us. When we're dealing with the pain, we got to remember that we have to release the pain. What happens in our lives when we're dealing with pain and, and, and search, what we do is we rehearse it or we repress it. But what we need to do is we need to release it. You see, we rehearse it. When someone hurts us, oftentimes what we do is we go over it in our minds over and over and over and over again. And the person that wronged us is living in our head rent-free because we're all rehearsing it. And we're letting that pain, instead of letting it go, releasing the pain, we're rehearsing it in our minds. And it's completely unhealthy to do that. Or the other way that we deal with pain is we repress it. We push it to a corner of our lives, a corner of our heart that we do not examine. And we do not want to deal with it. We don't want to do anything with it. We just want it to be there. And as a result, it grows bitter and we get angry and we don't even understand why because we've never dealt with the hurt and the circumstances in our lives. But what we need to do when it comes to our pain is we need to release the pain. And last, we need to remember that God has a plan. When we're wounded, when we're in pain, when life stinks, we have to remember that God has a plan. You see, I told you about my wife in July of 2007 and, and August of 2007 and how difficult um, that time was in our life. And God had a plan. And we dealt with uh, the grief and we dealt with the frustrations of that plan. One year to the day, August 10th. 2008. So on our sixth wedding anniversary, our son Jackson was born, uh, born healthy. Um, he just last month or two months ago, just turned uh, 12 years old, just started the sixth grade, uh, loves playing sports, loves being involved in church, all those kind of things. But you see, that was part of God's plan. We didn't understand 2007, so to speak, at, at, at the time. But 2008 brought a blessing. You see, but God had a plan. And I think sometimes in our lives that you need to realize that God has a plan. And so I looked up some scriptures because I think you need a but God in your life. Wherever you're at, maybe you need a but God. You see, uh, Joseph said, you intended to harm me, but God meant it for good. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. So I, I picked out a few verses here. Of a but, but God's in the Bible. In 1 Samuel 23, 14, it says this, David stayed in the Z desert strongholds and in the hills of the desert of, Z of Ziph. Day after day, Saul searched for him, but God did not give David into his hands. Psalm 73, 26, my flesh and my heart may fail, but God, my strength of heart and portion. Matthew 19, 26 says this, Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but with God, things are possible. Acts three fifteen. you killed the author of our life, but God raised him from the dead. Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. And one of my favorites is in Ephesians 2. It says this, And we were dead in the trespasses, we were dead in the trespasses and the sin and sins. We were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind, but God being rich in his mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together. By grace we have been saved. But God being rich in his mercy. And you see, maybe you're in a situation here today and you're in circumstances that you are facing here and you are in pain and you are wounded and you need a but God.
You need to stop and you need to pause and you need to remember that God can take uh, uh, things that don't seem to make any sense and he can make sense of them. You have to understand that God can take pain and he can draw you closer uh, to him and he can walk with you through the pain of your lives. Maybe you need to put God in a family situation. Maybe you need to put God in a health health. I'm not sure where you need the but God to work. But you do, and you know exactly where you're at. You see, that's what God does is sometimes he takes things that that are all messed up. You know, like Jesus dying on a Friday and being raised on a Sunday. Three days later, he was raised because God did something. But God worked. Where is it that you need a God in your life? Where is it in your life right now that you need a God to work? Would you bow your heads with me and would you pray for a few moments? Would you just think about where is it in your life that you need God to work? Where is it in your life that you feel life is unfair or uncertain or you're facing the unknown? Where is it that you've given into temptation and you need to seek that repentance and you need to seek that forgiveness and you need to realize that your relationship with Jesus is the most important thing that you can have? Where is it that you need a but God in your life? God, help us to remember. Help us to remember that there's situations in our life that are meant for evil, but you make them for good, that you can take our trials and our tribulations and you can turn them into good things. Father, would you help us to to long for you? Would you help us to desire you? Would you help us to be comforted if we need comfort? Would you bring us peace if we need peace? Bring us joy. God, would you bless us and make us a blessing? Father, we love you and we thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly To him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen.